Meanwhile, the fog and the darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a, of a church whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations, afterward as if his if its teeth were chattering in his frozen head up there. The cold became intense in the main street at the corner of the court. Some laborers were, were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in the brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing sullenly congealed and turned into misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops were where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruby as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom had he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up to up to morrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sa sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold, if the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole and rega to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of, God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congeal frost. At length the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tactly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank who instantly snuffled his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said, Scro said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop a half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound, the, cl the clerk s smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay you a day's wages for no work? The clerk, ob the clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin but I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk with the lawn ends of, the, of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill at the end of the lane of boys twenty times, in honor of its being Christmas Eve, then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which, one, which had once belonged to his deceased partner. There were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of a building up a yard, where it had so little business to be, that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with other houses, and forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in, lived in it but Scrooge, 
the other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in a mournful meditation on the threshold. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place, also that Scrooge had as a little of what is called fancy about him as a man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation aldermen and livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Molly since this last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face, it was not impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Molly used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were per perfectly motionless. That and its livid color made it horrible, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at, it, at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy would be untrue. But he put his hand in, upon the key he had relinquished turned it sturdily, walked in, and, light, and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Molly's pigtail sticking out of the hole. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and, and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Pooh, pooh! and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine in the wine merchant cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs, or through a bad young act of parliament, but I mean to say you might have gotten a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadwise with the splinter bar towards the wall and the door towards the balustrades, and done it easy. There was plenty of width for that, and room to spare. Which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lit lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, a small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in, the dress, in his dressing gown which was hanging upon, up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual, old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. 
quite satisfied, he closed the door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was oblig obliged to sit close to it and broad over it. Before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel, the fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all around with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Belshazzar's apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts. And yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Molly's head on every one. Humbug, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. Sev and after several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell, that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour, the bells ceased as they, as they had begun together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging, heavy, were dragging a heavy chain over the cask in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound and then he heard the noise much louder, on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when, without a pause, it came upon through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up, as though it cried, I know him, Molly's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same face, Molly in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head, the chain he drew was clasped about his middle. He was, it was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledges, deeds, hev and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge observing him and looking through his waistcoat could see the two buttons on his coat behind.